Praise the Lord, everyone. This is Pastor Whitfield coming to you on this Sunday, September 20, 2015, welcoming you to our social media broadcast. Today, we're going to talk about the power of the Christian's mouth, words, meaning, faith, and heart. So let us pray and we'll go right into the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for this day. We thank you for your people all over the world, for those that are tuning in and watching us on the various social media sites. We pray that the word of the Lord will be a rich blessing in their hearts, their minds, and in their spirits, and that they will grow and mature by your word. So, Father, we thank you in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. We're going to be going to Matthew, the 21st chapter, and the 17th verse, which reads as follows. And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Down in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth from ever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, Ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And the latter verse 22, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive it. Amen. So thus the word of the Lord. So let us go right into the message for today. So if we look at the word of the Lord, jumping down to verse 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done as you stated. Amen. So we know that here in the scripture of the Bible lets us know that in verse 17 of chapter 21, that Jesus went into the city of Bethany, and the Bible lets us know that he lodged there overnight. He stayed in that particular city overnight. Then when the morning come, as we all are accustomed to after a sleep, that we are Hungry, our body needs to be filled with fuel for the day, substance, food that we can eat and take within ourselves so that we are able to function throughout the course of the day. So the lesson begins with a hunger. So the question that I have to you, how hungry are we? How hungry are you as a child of God? to see miracles, divine miracles happening. The words that we speak out of our mouths having the power to generate a hunger. How hungry are we for righteousness? How hungry are we for God? How hungry are we in following in our pursuit of Jesus Christ? How hungry are we allowing to allow or how hungry are we to allow the Holy Spirit to have preeminence and control and lead and guide us and direct us and be the comforter that God intended how hungry are we for righteousness how hungry are we for the kingdom of God to come how hungry are we to see the prophetic mantle being released according to the way that God intended it to be released how hungry are we for the taught word how hungry are we for the preach word how hungry are we to be taught and to humble our souls before an almighty God that he can use us in ways 
that we have not seen thus far in our lifetime that we can walk the walks and do the works of Jesus Christ while it is day, that we might do the works because he said that we would do greater works. So when he's talking about greater works, he's talking about greater works than he performed while he was walking on the face of the earth. He's talking about he has given us power, dudamus power, to be able to do the miraculous and to do so so that we can uplift him and that all men are drawn unto him. How hungry are we? What are we hungering and thirsting for? Are we hungering for the kingdom to come? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Are we praying and hungering for a heavenly existence? Not in the eternal, but in the very present state that we are in. God is looking not so much so for the hungering of those that are without. Yes, he wants that. But he is looking for the hunger of those who are within him that will help the cause and to generate a hunger and a thirst within those that are without. And the way that the hunger and the thirst is going to be realized is when we invoke the very presence of the living God through our lives, through our words, through our actions, through our morality, through our ability to walk in sustained holiness and righteousness, when we're no longer bickering and arguing and, and having divisions amongst ourselves, when we grow up and become the men and women of God, then we put away childish things, all of this stuff about wanting houses and lands and cars and prestige, those are childish things when it pertains to the mind of God. God's mind is a whole lot larger than the materialistic things that we are in hot pursuit of. The Bible says this, if you will seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, he said, all of these things shall be added unto you. The Bible says that he will, that your soul would prosper. That we would prosper even as our soul prosper. The emphasis being on our souls prospering. The spirit man growing, maturing, developing and becoming that individual that God intends for it to be. So he goes on to say, so when Jesus saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently, immediately, the fig tree withered away. And when his disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is this fig tree withered away? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, truly I say to you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the midst of the sea, it shall be done. So faith has to do with with our moral convictions. What are we morally convicted of? If we have faith, morally, we would check our lives to see if we're walking in the morality of the Lord, Jesus Christ. If we're patterning our lives to walk after his morality and his will and his desire. So faith is a complete and total reliance upon Jesus Christ. It is consistency in our profession and belief in him with absolutely nothing 
wavering. It's having the understanding that he can do things that are humanly impossible for us to accomplish. But to him, they are an easy task to fulfill. He has absolute control over all things. And it's our belief that he does have absolute power in control over absolutely everything. So let's look at the enemy of faith, which is doubt. Doubt is faltering in our faith in Christ Jesus. That's to say, he can't do it. And the words can't do it when it pertains to God's ability to perform does not exist in his vocabulary. The only way and the only reason why it exists in God's vocabulary is when it's against his will, his holiness, and his righteousness. God can't sin. He can't do it. God can't lie. He is truth. God can't hate unless it's against someone who hates his will. But when it comes to performing of miracles, God can do it. Doubt. But it really means, when we doubt, this is what it really means. It means I restrict, prevent, or disallow God to do or to perform a deed, an act, or a miracle in my life. How impoverished is that thought process? How demeaning, crippling, debilitating to us is that thought process when we restrict God from moving in our lives. Doubt is an enemy to God's will. Doubt is not only spoken out, but it begins in the deep thought processes of our minds. Our minds think about what's impossible, but our thought processes need to be changed for what appears and is impossible to humanity and translate that energies into what is possible or doable and in the will and in the mind of God to act on and to do. Doubt, listen, is the devil's seed to hinder and to destroy and to annihilate and to remove your victory your miracle, and God's fulfillment of God's word over your life. That is the spirit of doubt. When you look at the word, when Jesus says unto his disciples, ye shall not only do, I want to stop there. We want to look at one little word, do, D-O. Do means to agree, to perform, to execute, to cause to happen, and to create. Ye, sh ye shall say, when you look at the word, let me go back to the word do. Do means, when Jesus said, ye shall not only do, this means that he has given us the authorization and the ability by his spirit and by his name, Jesus Christ to act, and to perform, and to do. Now, do is very interesting because it's tied to the very next statement, which means, in the latter part of the verse, but let me read that, ye shall not only do this, which is done to the fig tree, but also, if ye shall say. Ye shall say means command. Command meaning that you will have command. 
command to direct, to give orders to, to have authority over. This is in the place of a military command. Most of us who have served in the military knows that when a commander, one that is in a position of authority, of high rank, whether it's an NCO or whether it is an officer or a chief warrant officer, when it comes from a superior authority, we know that it's a command. And regardless of what our thought processes may be, that command was issued with the intent of an action being placed behind the words. This is the same way that the Lord is telling us that when we have faith and speak the word of the Lord in faith with nothing doubting, we command situations, our problems, our difficulties to do what the word of the Lord commands it to do. In the place of worry, God commands peace. And you can command peace in your life. Every single time that someone comes into my home, they always talk about the great peace that they feel. Because I prayed earnestly that God would fill me with peace and then fill my home with peace so that if anyone walks in, they will feel the peace of God. I commanded the atmosphere to come into the peacefulness of God. And you have that ability to speak peace in the midst of every single situation. Even when your body is racked with pain, you have the ability by the Spirit of God to speak health, wholeness, and soundness by the Word of God with nothing doubting in your heart. Believe in the Word of the Lord. So when you look at those words, Jesus said, it, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, when you look at the word mountain, it means to rise up, to rear up. So when Jesus said, ye shall speak unto this mountain, and be thou removed, and be thou cast into the midst of the sea, he said, it shall be done. The mountain of your situations, your calamities, your despair, your despondency. He's saying, if you would but speak to that impossible situation, that's too massive, too large, too wide, too high, has a base and has a firm foundation. He means this, if you would but speak to it, it would take wings and fly away and cast itself into the midst of the sea. Now, the midst of the sea is very interesting and very important that we talk about it. Because when he talks about being cast into the midst of the sea, He's talking about it being cast into a place that has a depth where you will not be able to see it again. Nor will you go deep sea diving, diving for it. Because spiritually, you will not have the apparatus to deep dive and to go to retrieve it. In other words, once you've spoken to the word, to the mountain, and it takes flight from out of your life, it will be removed into a place of unknown. It will not be known by you again. It will travel to the depths of the abyss from which each and every last part of your situations came from. And there it will remain Forever. In other words, when you think about it again, it will only be as a testimony. 
You will not feel the impacts, the adversity of it, the fear of it, the control of it, the manipulation of it, the sleepless nights from it, the agony that came from it. It will be cast far away from you forever. Can you say that with me? It will be cast away from me forever. Forever is forever. And forever has no conclusion. Which means you don't have to fear. You don't have to worry. You don't even have to think about it. When God has taken it away from you, it is God forever. So he says the mountain and be thou removed to cause this is when he says be thou removed. Listen, I want to use the word doubt again, but I want you to hear clearly how I'm going to use it. But when it says be thou removed, this is to cause doubt, not in you. This is to cause doubt in the very spirit of wickedness evil that brought doubt into your life. This, by you invoking the word of God, of God, having confidence in the word of the Lord, and really listen to what you're saying in agreement with, your, with the spirit of God, with your mind, with your heart, and with your mouth, all in faith. You cause doubt to come into the very circumstances and the powers of darkness that you, that once used to, to cripple you in your faith, now your faith causes doubt in those demonic spirits that they can no longer hold on to you. It causes them to doubt their purpose, their ability. And it causes them to lose their grasp on you, releasing you to walk in a greater measure of faith. So you're now flipping the script and turning the tables on the spirit of the Antichrist, the demonic spirit, the Beelzebub. And you're letting them know that by your saying, be thou removed, you're saying to those spirits that this is time, this is your, in essence, you turn the table, flipping the script, and turning back on the devil, what he placed on you. I wanted to make that statement. This is you telling them to believe their own lies. And all the terror that comes along with it now will terrorize those spirits that used to terrorize you and keep you from sleeping restfully. The word cast in that verse, it says, and be thou removed and be thou cast into the midst of the sea. This is you thrusting off the waste material, the dung, by saying everything, that, <laughs> hallelujah, Jesus, everything that used to control and buy was nothing but waste byproducts. God said, let it pass from your life. You don't have to carry that waste anymore. So it means, and it shall be done. It's conclusive. This isn't the conclusion of doubt when the believer's life. But it shall be done. Is the conclusion of faith. It is must obey the word of God. It must obey the believer's voice of faith. It will be dislodged and removed. This is what you believe, that it will be dislodged. It will be removed. Nothing wavering. When a believer in faith speaks and they believe, it is done, which means they don't have to revisit it or speak it again. That's why Jesus says, don't think that you'll be heard because of your many words. He's not looking for your words, your vocabulary, your ability to articulate and express yourself. 
He's looking for your faith tied into what you are saying. And what you say brings the results. There are times when I pray, I have to be honest, I use many words. And there are times when I pray simplistic prayers. And what I've noticed through the years, the simplistic prayers, when they are tied into my heart and they come forth, they have brought more results than me praying for hours at a time. Sometimes I'm sitting, sometimes I'm walking, sometimes I'm in the shower. Sometimes I'm in my car. Sometimes I'm at my place of employment. Sometimes I'm just out walking. And I will pray those simplistic prayers. And immediately, or almost immediately, it's seen results come because my heart was fully engaged in a place that God could move quickly upon it. So it shall be done. Shall is a definitive word, meaning that it will happen. As the believer has believed. John 1 in 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So it's important that we know the Word of God because it is God. So when we speak the Word of God in faith, so when we're talking the Word, we're talking God. When we're praying the Word, we're praying God. When we're believing the word, we're believing God. When we meditate on the word, we're meditating on God. So when we speak in faith by the word of God, we're speaking God. Then the question is, does God waver on anything that he does? Which we asked early, absolutely not. If this is true, then why do we waver when we're speaking the word of God? In prayer, in faith, in conversation, we'll say it one way, then we'll retract the power of it another way. Let us believe what we speak. The Bible says, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We'll talk about that in depth in just a couple of minutes. Or are we not really sure of the words itself, its application and its revelance, etc. John 1 and 3 says, says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh. God wants your flesh. We're talking about Jesus Christ in this scripture. But God wants the flesh of his word to cause your flesh to move by his word. Yes, I know that flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom, but while we're in this earthly existence, God wants the word to be made flesh in you, that you will feel the word, breathe the word, walk in the word, rest in the word, sleep in the word, live. In the word. It said, and the word was made flesh and dwell amongst us. And we beheld this, we and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hebrews 11 and 1 says this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen, for by the elders attain a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The word substance here means confidence. Confidence that is supported by God. When you are confident in the word of God and God feels your confidence in it, he supports his word, and he supports his children. Let me say it again. He supports his words, and he supports his children. He supports his children's usage of his word when they are walking with the faith 
to believe him. So God backs up his servants that uses his words appropriately, faithfully, knowing what it means and applying it to the right situation. So they hope for, and goes on to say, of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Let me just deal with this because the Holy Ghost gave me such a great profound insight on this word evidence. Evidence is proof. We all know that. And have you ever believed God so strongly that although you can't see the blessing, you know that it's right there and that it's yours. It's so strong that every fiber in your being stands up at attention. And when there's no doubt, no fear, no concern, only jubilation in your soul that you're about to receive the blessings of the Lord. And when you least expect it, what you feel in your spirit showed up. This is the evidence without seeing. Because, listen, your spirit man bore witness to what God released in the spiritual realm into the natural realm. And it was your spirit man speaking to your natural soulish man that your prayers, blessings, and usage of the word has manifested in the realm, in, in the realm of the spirit. And your soul was enlightened by your spirit, by the spirit of God, to see what your natural eyes could not see, but your spirit and your soul communicated. And just like Mary and Elizabeth, the spirit man, when he spoke to your soul, your soul, the babe in your womb, the blessing that you were expecting God for, leaped in the womb of your soul and translated that into the natural that gave the exuberance in your soul that although your natural eyes could not see, but your spirit man saw it and spoke it and caused a great level of faith and belief to know what you were expecting, although you did not receive it, although you have not yet apprehended it, although you've not laid hold to the promise, you know within your soul, it was already done. <laughs> and you were just waiting by the Spirit of God for the very manifestation. But you began to rejoice and shout and break out in the dance and worship God because you knew your prayers and your word, your faith had already been responded to. And Michael may be warned in the heavenlies to bring it, but nonetheless, your exuberance, your excitement, your zeal adds and aids him in accomplishing your warfare to bring it to a complete end and that the manifestation of God was soon to appear and manifest itself at your doorstep, at your house, changing things that you could not change, answering questions and prayers in such a magnificent way that when it shows up, you have all the more the reason to rejoice. This is the evidence. Faith without seeing, but yet believing and feeling the evidence. Let me tell you, one of the major things about the evidence, it is proof that God was on the scene. Why? Because his DNA is attached to every scene that he has operated on. And everyone has proof and evidence that this 
was a God thing. Let God be exalted and all flesh be made abased in his presence. Let God be exalted and let all of his enemies flee from him. I'm speaking to your ability today to speak the word of God in faith and to generate godly results. This is an act to improve, empower, increase your faith. We're here to increase Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. We are here to increase your faith. Romans 10, 17 says this. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The more you hear about faith, the more your faith will increase. Psalms 27, 13 says this, I have fainted unless I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Believe in the word of God that you speak out of your mouth will prevent you from passing out in the day of adversity. It will keep you grounded, focused, stable, and clear on your godly objectives in him. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Knowing the power that God placed in your mouth will change how you communicate. It will cause you to think before speaking and to weigh our words carefully. It's giving the heart and the mouth the opportunity to think, is this life or is this death that I'm about to speak? Then it becomes a conscious decision in faith to speak life. It trains its senses to discern between good and evil, God and evil, God's word and the words of the devil. It trains the senses to be attuned and sharp when it comes to the word of God. Are we bringing something on ourselves because of our word choices, our poor word choices, or our poor ability to retain the word of, the God, of God or to know the word of God? Or does my word choices always represent God and communicate down to the, to the happiness that is within my soul? Matthew 7 and 7 says this, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. But what man is there of you of whom, if his son asks bread, will give him a stone? Or if, his, or if he asks a fish, will give him a serpent? If then, if then being evil, if, the, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? God will always gives us, give us that good thing. Isaiah 53 and 1 says this, Who have believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? God is waiting to cause you to believe his report and to reveal his strength, his power, and his will as a result of your faith and the eradication of doubt from your heart and from your spirit. Isaiah 53 and 12, therefore will I divide a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he has was numbered with the transgressions, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Listen, 2 Corinthians 4.13 says this, 
We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it's written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. We believe, therefore we speak. Listen, therefore I have spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. When you believe the word of God over every single situation in your life, speak it and watch God move. 2 Corinthians 4.16 For which cause we faint not, but through our, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. God wants your inward man to be removed, renewed. Mark 16.17 and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Shall they? Listen, when we talk about speaking, the, the power of the Christian's mouth, words, meaning, faith, and heart, this is what Jesus says. Let me go back to the 15th verse and read down. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils, demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and set on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming <laughs> the word of the Lord with signs following. And we're going to put as the word says, an amen right there. Because I believe if you hear the word of the Lord today, and walk under what God has said. We have the faith. We have the power. You are a little powerhouse because Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And he has given all power that is at his disposal into the hands of the believers to do his will on earth. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, today we pray. Amen. God bless you. And we'll see you back here on next Sunday. Have a wonderful week in the word of the Lord. And share with your family members, friends, co-workers, church members, that the word of the Lord is being powerfully declared on social media. God bless you. We love you. In the name of Jesus Christ.